I would uh, personally like to begin with something about Oxford. All right, yes. But since we're here in Canberra, and you've been here now in three weeks, three weeks in Canberra. Six weeks. In Six Canberra. weeks already in Canberra. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you want to, we should maybe begin with something about Canberra. What, what impressions is this? Has this place made any? But I think we should begin, as I said just now, with, uh, with something about my own misgivings about making films and All right. making records of this kind of anybody who passes through, whether, whatever their claims to the attention of posterity. Because it could be said that, uh, in a very strict sense, they are impertinent. Uh, namely, the reason a bloke comes here is because he's written something, and what he's written is there, and what he wishes to be known of himself is there in black and white. Mm -hmm. And that, so long as there's no general universal conflagration, will survive, and people can always read it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, people looking at his image may or may not think that he looks like the best kind of clothes model. And those who think he looks like a clothes model will tend to think the less of his work, mm -hmm. and those who don't may tend to think equally improperly the more of his work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, those, I think, are impertinent considerations. Mm -hmm. So I might be completely round and fuzzy and orange-coloured all over. It wouldn't make any difference to what's there in print. Mm -hmm. But do you, do you, don't you see people communicating more um, than just through the, the written word? I mean, what about uh, yeah, so just communicating and talking, we're not, we're talking not, with you? Yeah, but we're not communicating. In the first place, um, you and I think so much alike that this is a a highly fictitious exercise that you're not going to be asking me any questions to which you don't know the answer in advance. And uh, so it's not a communication in that sense. It's not a communication with anybody even five minutes from now, mm -hmm. because I'm not talking to them. Since the essence of a communication is you know to whom you're talking and what is the point of talking in that particular way to that particular person on that occasion. That's communication. But now this it isn't. But if I, if I were to probe you about the early days in Oxford, for which I, I'm still anxious to... He's insistent. Insistent, right. Yes. But if I were to probe you on those early days, um, yes. I'm certain I'd learn something that I, I haven't known before. I mean, these are, these are, this is a period that, that interests me a great deal. All right. All right. Yes. And right. That in front yes. of it, we might... We yeah. might Why does it interest you so hmm? much? Well, one imagines Oxford, say, in the early... When did you go up to Oxford? In the 48. 48. 48. 48. Yeah. 48. Well, one imagines Oxford at that time as a kind of, of golden period. Very interesting people were there. Dumont was there already, wasn't he? I think Dumont came rather later, about 1950 or something like that. And Radcliffe Brown was still around? I met Radcliffe Brown a few times, yes. He quite uh -huh. often came. But E.P. had taken over as professor? Oh, yes, yes. The year before I came up. Mm -hmm. And you had, doing, doing their studies at that time, you had... Bohannon? Yes. Bo both Bohannons? Both Bohannons. Jim Bohannon was a lecturer. Yes. And David Pocock was there? Yes. Uh, I suppose he was already there as a student, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Beattie? Was he there? The year after me, I think. Uh -huh. And Mary Douglas? She was there. She yes. was there. And yes. Fred Bailey was there for a while. That's right. Yes. Oh, and yes, who else? Indeed. I haven't thought about those days for so long. Who else was there? Francis Huxley was there. Francis Huxley. What was he? He was doing his... He had come back he from had, the field? or He'd just done BSc. He was just off, I think, to um, the Urubu. Uh -huh. It was a very tiny world, of course. I think you probably catalogued everyone who was around. If you remember, there's a print of the... Uh, what I think it was called University Lodge, which was a tiny mock Gothic cottage mm, uh -huh. fit for storing gardeners and gardeners tools in. There was more space for rakes and tools than there was for gardeners. Mm -hmm. And we were in the upper floor of that, underneath the underneath the eaves, practically. Where was that located? Then? That was on Parks Road. Parks Road. South Parks Road. South, South Parks, Parks Road, Road. Opposite what is the entrance to Rhodes House. Mm -hmm. And underneath was the beginnings of the organic chemistry department. So it was full of a, it really looked like a Walt Disney uh, depiction. You know the, the Sorcerer's Apprentice, yes? yes? yes. It was that, that, sort, that sort of environment, the mullioned windows and, and, and uh, gothic arches and, um, and, and fake iron trimmings on the doors, and things like that. Behind it, all the retorts and the tubes and steam and things bubbling and so on. And we had to make our way through that and then go upstairs. And we had this tiny set of rooms at the top. Mm -hmm. And there were about five or six of us there at a time. Mm -hmm. so that was one of the many moves that uh, social anthropology made in Oxford. And in each time, curiously enough, being shifted um, 
spatially from the prestigious center out to the out, outskirts, out to the despised uh -huh. suburbs of uh -huh. the university. Uh -huh. Yes. Well, then, when did the move to Keeble Road occur? You shared that with geography, didn't you? We didn't share that with geography because it's part of a long, long terrace. Mm -hmm. So we have more or less of an independent part mm -hmm. uh, to live in. It was next door to the house where Joyce Carey used to live. Uh -huh. And we looked out over the University Park, yeah. so, uh, and then southward onto Keeble College, which was magnificent uh, uh, Fair Isle brickwork. But that was merely one stage in a, in a successive um, a a series of moves outwards. outwards. And I think that expressed also the, the loss of esteem that the, that the subject suffered. Mm -hmm. and when it started off in Oxford, I don't mean in 1884 when uh, Tylor was the, was the first professor really of anthropology, but in 1905 when the Diploma in Social Anthropology, in Anthropology, was founded, um, it was founded at the instance of an enormously a prestigious set of people, led by T.H. Huxley and people of that kind, who said that anthropology was going to be the new greats. Hmm? It was going to be a challenge to all former methods of studying civilization. And uh, on the committee that established it, I think there was a professor from each one of the faculties of the day, mm -hmm. men of enormous scholarly renown. And as you know, the first reader in social anthropology from, I think, 1910, was Marit, who was the rector, rector of Exeter, mm -hmm. and uh, we enjoyed enormous favor in those days. Tiny uh, organization, but enormous favor. And as the organization increased in numbers and in independence, and in the end in efficacy, scholarly efficacy, so concomitantly its uh, reputation within the university uh, failed, that those great figures who had uh, supported it uh, tended to fall away, and bit by bit we became submerged under a sluggish wave of contumely <laughs> and, and neglect, I, I would think. Yeah. Hmm. Well, let's, let's go back to 1948. Yeah. This, is absolute, this is absolutely normal in a way, because the, uh, I, I, I think it's a lesson of the development of universities that uh, um, as a, a particular subject, particularly a relatively new one, uh, acquires formal solidity and a substance mm. in, in the form of, uh, of buildings, and then, of course, the accretion of turn it posts and so on, so it tends to become inevitably bureaucratized and uh, subject to negative publicity. Mm -hmm. And, of course, then there are other factors, but... Okay, well, let's, yeah. go, let's go back to 1948. E.P. had just succeeded as professor. Or as he... Mm -hmm. And who else was teaching there? You're asking, the you're asking the wrong person, in a way, because I really have a highly defective memory. Hmm. Um, I've sometimes claimed to have forgotten things and reported truly that I've forgotten mm. them. And people have jumped up and down like characters in one of Dostoevsky's novels and said, but you can't have forgotten that. <laughs> Until I was rescued by, by my sons who would say with innocent candor, but he forgets everything. <laughs> you know? So, let's see if I remember. All right, E.P. Mm. E.P. Yes. was there. That one you weren't Yes, yes. Dark-haired, yes. vigorous, looking, as everyone says, like another Welsh magician, you know, rather like Lloyd George. Uh -huh. And he had something, too. I don't, know, I don't know about it. Remember that Wittgenstein once castigated Norman Malcolm for talking about national character? And, uh, and uh, poor Norman Malcolm was in the doghouse for about a year and a half to have him mention the possibility of national character, which Wittgenstein was thought, was thought was a, a, a nucleary idea. Anyway, I think there may be something in it, because there's obviously a similarity between Lloyd George and between Evans Pritchard. They're both, they're both Welshmen, they both look Welsh, they had similar features. Actually, rather embarrassingly, Evans Pritchard had similar features to, uh, to Radcliffe Brown. Oh, but, but, really? that, but that's a... But oh Radcliffe yes. Brown wasn't Welsh. He wasn't Welsh, no, oh. no. Oh. Well, that undermines what I was going to say, wasn't yes, it? But anyway, but there, go was, ahead. there was this marked similarity between Lloyd George and, uh, and Evans Pritchard. And in particular, you know, this, this dark, Celtic intelligence mm -hmm. shining from their eyes, which is really just a form of trickiness, you know, and a sort of hyper-acute curiosity, not, mm -hmm. not uh, diminished by any sort of scruple mm -hmm. in the affairs of other people. And I think, uh, obviously, in Lloyd George's case, it made him into a, a superb politician. Mm -hmm. And he's not the sort of thing one wants to be superb at, but he was. Do you think that made E.P. into a superb And I think it made him into a superb ethnographer. Mm -hmm. There's an almost prurient degree of curiosity had in the doings of anybody at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you could discover, uncover, disclose anything about somebody 
that hadn't been known, particularly for something that the subject wished never to be known. Mm -hmm. He would work he, at finding it. Oh, yes, he would work at it and he'd be triumphant at having discovered it. Yes. He was intensely interested in human beings. Maliciously, some people said, but he was that interested, and I think the reflection of it is, uh, is to be found in, in superb, if not. All right, now who did he bring to the Institute, or did he, did he come to an Institute already formed by Radcliffe Brown? No, uh, Radcliffe Brown really didn't form anything. There was already, since 1914, at Oxford, what was called a Department of Social Anthropology. That was established at the instance of Rector Merritt, and that was what was in existence when Radcliffe Brown came. And he came with enormous ambition to found an honor school in mm -hmm. social anthropology. Um, he is uh, tremendously, uh, scientifically keen on the new form of comparative sociology. He was contemptuous of the museum people. And uh, apparently, people like uh, Balfour and uh, extremely nice and hardworking um, men over at the Pitt Rivers Museum were very much put out to be, um, as it were, deliberately shunned on quasi-intellectual mm -hmm. grounds because they weren't true scientists of the kind that Radcliffe Brown took social anthropology to be. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Anyway, when he came, there wasn't very much. There was this tiny hut, this little shack that we were in, mm -hmm. the title of the Department of Social Anthropology, and his chief effect was to have the title changed to Institute on a number of grounds. Firstly, I think because he imagined it sounded rather grander than Department, mm -hmm. and in fact, it makes it sound only the more suspect hmm? mm -hmm. and, and peripheral. Mm -hmm. And I once drew up a list of uh, institutions in London which called themselves institutes. And they were institutes of, uh, of psychotherapy, institutes of beauty care, hmm? institutes of traffic regulations, things of this kind. And so we simply dropped ourselves into that um, rather disrespectful company by well, changing the subject. Well, did changing the name change the status of the, the place? Or was it simply a name change? It didn't change the status because it, it had no statutory status. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't had really until a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. um, when at least I procured some sort of a statutory change. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, when he came, he came, I think, in 1936 or 7, 7, I think it was. But then, shortly afterwards, the war began. I think he appointed uh, Maya Fortis to a position there. Um, Franz Steiner came later, and I think there are only three or four students, including Bill Newell, who is now at Sydney, mm -hmm. and Henricus, who I think is now back in the, um, in the West Indies. And uh, anyway, the war came. It was obviously coming very quickly. And when the war came, for some reason, Radcliffe Brown left Oxford and Britain and went away to Sao Paulo to represent British intellectual interests. And he stayed there until the war ended. By the time the war was over, he was back. The tenure of his chair was almost up. And the EP was almost about be elected into it. And so it, it's hard to see really that Radcliffe Brown had any effect on social anthropology in Oxford. So then when, when E.P. came, Meyer Fortis was there. Meyer Fortis was there. And Steiner. And Steiner was there, mm -hmm. yes. Now what happened to Steiner? And Steiner, Steiner was the man of whom Evans Pritchard said he was the most scholarly person in social anthropology. It wasn't saying very much from E.P. because he didn't think that most social anthropologists were scholars anyway. And as you know, he published once in Man the observation which didn't much please most of his colleagues, that um, most social anthropologists, if put onto the academic market in some subject other than anthropology, would never have got a university position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Either because they were too stupid or too... <laughs> too or whatever. Mm. 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 So there were very few people there. Mm -hmm. mm. All right. Then whom, whom, who did he appoint then? Well, he appointed Godfrey Leonhardt. Godfrey Leonhardt. Yes. And that was... Yeah. Godfrey had done his field work by then. No, he did that after I came up to Oxford. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, then after when Franz Steiner died of a heart attack, mm -hmm. he appointed John Beatty to that position. John Beatty. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then he was um, chiefly instrumental in getting Godfrey Leonhardt's brother, Peter Leonhardt, mm -hmm. appointed. Mm -hmm. um, then. Uh, Dumont, he attracted Dumont, which was a, a great thing. And one of, the, uh, one of the chief effects of that was not only to meet Dumont himself, uh, an intensely scholarly man, very demanding, mm -hmm. uh, but also that Dumont introduced into Oxford uh, a knowledge of Dumézil. And uh, 
I think nobody had heard of him. Mm -hmm. And recently, Dumont has published an article on, um, on the study of oppositions, on dual classification, in which he, uh, I, I'm afraid, controverts Evans Pritchard about Hertz too. Because mm -hmm. Hertz, uh, um, E.P. says in the introduction to Right and Left, that throughout his tenure of his chair at Oxford, he gave lectures on Hertz. And this was the beginning of, of an interest in these topics. And Dumont said that when he got there, in fact, uh, E.P. had never heard of Hertz and hadn't read him. Mm -hmm. And there was no copy of Hertz in the library. Mm -hmm. So there, there's, a, there's a conflict of rec recollection there. But E.P. E. cites Hertz mm. several times in yeah, newer religion. In newer religion. But and that didn't come out to 56 after all. Right. But we also have the, we have, in, well, the Institute has E.P.'s copy of the Anne mm. Sociologie. Uh, that was Radcliffe Brown's oh, set. Oh, was Radcliffe Brown's set. Radcliffe Brown's set, yes. I see. Even has some of his marginalia in it, so yes, we, we know that he read parts of mm -hmm. it and yes. his sociology. Yes. 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 But anyway, the, the essential thing is that when Dumont came, he brought not only himself and his own ideas, but, uh, but an increased concentration on the analysis sociology, particularly Hertz, and, uh, and he introduced us to Dumézil. And uh, no doubt we should have caught up with Dumézil later, but it might have taken years and taken years and years. years. And years. Yes. Well, was, who was your supervisor then for your... Was Dumont when must I have been involved with you? He was my supervisor. Once. He was your supervisor? Yes, he was, yes. For your B-Lit? And, and also Chai was Srinivas, I'd forgotten about oh, Srinivas. Srinivas was, was the lecturer in Indian sociology. I see. That's right. Yes. And he came when uh, E.P. appointed Srinivas, or he was there e. from... E.P., I... No, no. Oh, Srinivas, Srinivas was a student of Radcliffe Brown's, mm -hmm. and he may or may not have been appointed by E.P. Mm -hmm. And then E.P. was my own supervisor mm -hmm. for a time. Not that he did it much by supervision. I'm not saying he didn't read what I wrote. He may or may not have read it. Mm -hmm. But his, uh, the only comment I can think of him saying was that the, I think there was a comma too many somewhere, or there ought to be a comma, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Useful. Yes. Useful. Yes. He, he, he was an odd man. You, you know that he used to say of ethnography that what really counted was, um, was uh, not technicalities um, or some sort of thoroughgoing program a sort of Malinowski matrix in which you tick off the things you've done and not done, but you said impressions of the things that really count, hmm? just as they are the things that really count in responding to Tolstoy or, mm -hmm. or something like that. And uh, I think he used to get impressions also of theses. He examined two theses of mine, uh, first my B-list and then my b -fill. And um, did I say supervised or examined? Because he part supervised one, certainly. But he couldn't have been I examiner. He then. couldn't have been examiner. Yeah. But he examined me, I think, for both. Mm -hmm. That's right, he examined me for both. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he did, the first time in company with Hyman Dorf and the second in company with Edmund Leach. And he gave me the definite impression by the questions he asked that he really hadn't read the thesis on either, t on either occasion. I tried to gain some impression of the thesis, mm -hmm. but I'm sure he hadn't read it. I might add that I had E.P. and uh, Leach as my my examiners on yes. my deep field. Yes. And I think, uh, it, at least it seemed to me, that E.P. hadn't read beyond the first 20 pages of my thesis. Yeah. He certainly didn't yes. give it any exactly. impression of having read it. Whereas Leach mm. was very thorough. And oh, yes. He went over the thesis. Oh, indeed. Oh, yes. He went over yes. the thesis in yes. great detail. Yes. So. And Leach, I must say, was always, I mean, quite apart from his own intellectual verve and, and the value of his works, um, uh, to me, he was always tremendously important because I'd, as it were, dogged his footsteps in many ways. And then he was in the Burma army, I was in the Indian, Indian army in Burma. Um, he went to Sarawak, I followed him to Sarawak. And uh, at every stage, he was trem um, tremendously Im uh, important to me. I, I, asked him, I asked him once, how'd you get to Borneo? <laughs> <laughs> And so he typed out on some rickety machine he must have bought in some sort of Victorian auction. He typed out page after page of foolscap about how to get to Borneo, you know, and how to get some money, and when you've got some money, how to get it from A to B, and what you live on when you get there, things of this kind. Well, what, what made you decide to go to Borneo? I mean, you're, you had yeah. interest, previous interests in, in Burma. Yes, um, yes. Why, why did you decide on, on well, Borneo instead of Burma? I had been as far... Um, as far south and east as, um, as Malaysia, mm -hmm. Singapore, mm -hmm. and to the east I've been as far as, as Cambodia. And I was completely committed to Southeast Asia. It was the mm -hmm. only form of 
It's the only frame of adult life that I'd ever known. Mm -hmm. um, I loved it. I couldn't conceive living a life anywhere else. But I wanted to see more of it. And Borneo was the next place, obviously, to go southeast. One of the obvious places yes. to go. Well, one was tempted, or one has to be tempted, towards places like Bali, and my romantic inclination was to go there. But I knew very well, I'd been to the University of Leiden, and I knew before I went, and they certainly taught me after I'd been there, that you couldn't seriously work on Bali without a preparation in a literature going back to 1597 in Dutch, um, without some knowledge of Sanskrit, without a good command of Kawi to begin with, and then, of course, of modern Balinese. Mm -hmm. And it was quite clear that would take five, six, or seven years to do, which I hadn't got. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I had to go for very, very much uh, the second best. And that was Borneo. But once again, there, 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 there were two romantic inclinations. In the first place, the pictures of the people published by um, Hose and McDougall in Pagan Tribes of, uh, yes. of Borneo are certain being tremendously handsome, beautifully built, light skinned, high cheekbones, slanting eyes, and long, straight black hair, and so on. And I adored this, uh, as I still do. And that was one of the chief reasons I went to Borneo. And then, of course, there was another romantic inclination, which was that in 1947, the man had gone out, I think, from the Field Museum at Chicago, looking for Penan, so-called Punan, in, in the middle of Borneo. And he came back and he published an article in uh, the American Anthropologist saying there weren't any such people. It's a category mistake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, uh, that Punan were, were simply members of other tribes, real tribes, who wandered off into the forest for a time. While they were there, they were called Punan. When they were back, they weren't. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that was highly implausible because there were, I had about a hundred or more references in the Dutch literature to these peoples, and they seemed to be real people. So I went there to see if they really did exist. That was the first, uh, a romantic impulsion. And I think that's quite important, um, that it was a romantic impulsion, because what I think Evans Pritchard was certainly a romantic. And without listing other anthropologists, I think it could be claimed that those who in the end have made uh, the most interesting, perhaps most lasting contributions, have been fundamentally romantics and not Radcliffe Brownian quotes, scientists. Scientist. They were not scientistic, but they were pure-blooded romantics. Mm -hmm. and, and there's nothing incompatible between being a romantic, doing things for the sake of sensation or beauty, or novel experience, whatever it may be, and doing something serious on the other hand. So those are the reasons I went there. Mm -hmm. Well then, you you came back to Oxford, what, in 52 or 53? came back at the end of 52, I think it was. 52. Yes, uh -huh. yes. And you, you immediately finished your... Then you I took did, a year or... I, so I to took... Uh, I wrote it in a calendar year. Calendar year. A thesis, yes. yes. And then went off to Sumba. Yes. Directly yeah. back to Sumba. Yeah, directly back uh -huh. to Sumba. And that it was, was a mistake. Looking, looking back, uh, that was obviously a mistake. Mortimer Wheeler, the archaeologist, has a, uh, a precept which I gather he used to impose when he was director of the Archaeological Survey of India that you never embarked on one piece of research until you've written up the, pre the previous one. Mm. Yes. So I think that was a mistake, but uh, I wanted to get out again, uh -huh. and it was the only opportunity I had in a way. Uh -huh. And was that also a rom romantic impulsion? to go off to Sumba, or was Absolutely that not. motivated no, with... No, it's a, a purely theoretical one. I was uh -huh. interested in what was in those days called circulating canubium, and I wanted to go and make the beginning of a study of circulating canubium there. Uh -huh. But you, you also went back to Borneo at some point. I remember you yeah, telling that you back. went back to the Penan. Briefly, for I went for back in 55, I think it was, and I went back to them for four or five months in 1958. Yes, yes. So you've had two trips back to yeah, Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hated going back in 58 because the changes were already um, quite marked. The people were stopping to using the, the blowpipe. The number of shotguns that they had had increased. In my day, they had practically none. Um, they were beginning to wear more clothes. They were beginning to wear Malay types of ornaments to cover it. And, um, well, the moral uh, contrast was the worst. I think not only the... Uh, the incipient signs of a sort of degradation spreading in, moral degradation spreading in from the coast. But also one could see that the way people wear out. There's one lovely girl, for example, Jingin, who was uh, um, about 16 years old when I was first there. And I saw her six years, whatever it was, eight years later, and she looked as though she'd aged by about 15 or 20 years. And it's dreadful to see those. It's dreadful enough that such things happen, of course. Mm -hmm.
for this particular shot when you see them happen to people as you can. Like watching Evans Pritchard himself, for example, decline, as he did in his latter years, to see him decline physically and intellectually, and so deplorably as he did. Certainly when I arrived in Oxford, E.P., and this was in 62, E.P. was already an old man. Yes. White-haired. Uh, yes. 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 That happened quite quickly. Well, you finished, you, you went off to Sumba, you came back to Sumba, then did you, were you appointed immediately to the Institute, or did you teach somewhere else? I came, I, I came back in, in 55, and almost immediately was offered a job, at, a temporary job, at the University of Illinois. Oh. Julian Stewart was going away for a semester, and friends of mine who were there, uh, who was there? There was Edward Winter, and, and Lou Farrell, yes. and I think, oh, Dick Downs was later, mm -hmm. but those two were there at any rate. And Chuck Erasmus, who now teaches at Santa Barbara, they were there, and they asked me to go there for that semester. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of a, of a long love affair uh, with the United States, really. Uh -huh. It sounds a bit surprising to those who don't know the Midwest, you know, uh -huh. but the University of Illinois, in spite of being in the middle of all the cornfields, you know, with the with the choruses of pigs. I, I'm making that up because you never heard of pig in Illinois. They're far <laughs> too far away. But it was like out being out in the Russian steppes. It really was. And the University of Illinois was exciting too in those mm -hmm. days, certainly. Mm -hmm. Because they were conscious of being isolated in the middle of the, the cornfields. And so they, they were determined to be a sense of civilization. And that they were. Mm -hmm. It was bubbling with intellectual life. Concerts for cyclones. The library was excellent. And, and all the rest of it. So, well, you, you were asking, you weren't, you were asking was, about... You were actually asking about appointments and so on. Well, then, during that time that I was there, I was given the chance to stay there, mm -hmm. which was very kind of me. And you weren't tempted? Uh, well, it, the, well, it wasn't quite that simple, because there were other chances as well. I was offered then um, a lectureship at Oxford. There's a possibility of a lectureship at Cambridge. These were the palmy days, mm -hmm. you see, when almost anyone could get a job. Um, and, and then there were two departments in London, which I, I could have had a job. Mm -hmm. So there were about five or six openings. Mm -hmm. And uh, once again, I think being a romantic, as well as being um, by inclination, at any rate, a scholar, I, I, I... Oh, Harvard, I forgot Harvard. Oh. I was offered a, a post at Harvard by Clyde Clarkholm. Mm -hmm. And so it, essentially, the choice was not Illinois at all, but between uh, going to Harvard and going back to Oxford. Mm -hmm. And uh, being a romantic and being in, in many ways committed to an Oxford, which I was only just learning to understand. Um, no one ever does, but one's learning to understand. Um, I opted for Oxford. Th this may have had some effect on the, not only on my own work, but on the work that other people have done too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, it's conceivable, if you imagine some sort of Borges uh, story mm -hmm. of what would have happened if I'd gone to Harvard instead of Oxford. Mm -hmm. I'd have been thrown out. George Homer sort of had me slung <laughs> out, you know, within two or three years. Something like that. <laughs> well, all the best people get, well, not all, but many of the best people get thrown out of Harvard. I should certainly have got thrown out of Harvard, best or not. But, and then, but I should have been committed and happily committed to the United mm -hmm. States. And that might have had an effect on American anthropology. Mm -hmm. Or on the other hand, it might have got me out of anthropology, mm -hmm. which might have been happier for me. Mm. Well, when you went back then, was, was E.P. instrumental in, in, in tempting you to come back to, oh, to yeah. Oxford? Oh, of course. Oh, of course, yes. Yes. Yeah. Certainly. And you also had the opportunity of, of being associated with Merton, which you've been... What well, to go back to? Well, to go I back always to did belong to Merton. You always yeah. belonged to Merton. Yes, yes. 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 Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, because, because um, it, uh, it tends to be thought by some people who are resolutely anti-establishment, as they think, that these values, you know, the spirit of the regiment or attachment to the college and so on, are, belong to a bygone day of privilege. Mm -hmm. And those people who were inspired by these sentiments really didn't deserve to have them. And, and the objects of the sentiments didn't deserve to be the object and so on. But uh, in my own experience, that, that um, I'm not alone in thinking that the spirit of the regiment really does count um, intensely. Mm -hmm. And when you distinguish a good regiment from a bad one, a good battalion from a bad one, it's by its spirit that you distinguish it, not by its technical achievements. Mm -hmm. And you could have a, a technically efficient university, for example, in a margarine factory, yes? Mm -hmm. But we happen at Oxford to have a superb system of colleges, and the colleges attract people's loyalties, and the loyalties conduce to excellent work. Mm -hmm. 
So these were all enormous factors in taking me back to Oxford and not diverting me to Harvard. Mm -hmm. But I take it by implication then, the same spirit that, that pervades the colleges, um, you wouldn't say pervaded the institute or pervades the institute. I think it, no, it wasn't the feeding of comedy, it wasn't quite the feeding of comedy because the institute from the very earliest days that I can recall it was riven subliminally. I wasn't much allowed to show on the surface, but it was actually riven factionally on grounds of religious commitment and of sexual predilection and of lifestyle, by which I mean drinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, that ma they made an enormous divide mm -hmm. among those who were there. Mm -hmm. But um, on the intellectual score, it is quite true that for a few years, when E.P. was in his prime and vigorous and cared more about things of that kind than he later did, there was a conscience collective mm -hmm. in the Institute. Now, let's pinpoint those yeah. years. When, when were they? Well, they were roughly, I suppose, from the late 40s, certainly the early 50s, mm -hmm. and until perhaps around the year that E.P. published New Religion, 56, 56, something like that, yes, yeah. And yeah, go ahead. a number, oh, there are a number of factors, not all of which one can mention, mm -hmm. um, intervene. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, what you've got to realize is that we all focused intensely upon Evans Pritchard, mm -hmm. that whatever the word charismatic doesn't mean, or shouldn't mean, he was a charismatic figure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was essential to us, and we all congregated around him. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to explain to anybody uh, um, afterwards. I remember in, in 62, mm -hmm. there was the, the, the year of my diploma. Yes. It was probably the most exciting intellectual year yes. of my life. Yeah. Yeah. And it was still E.P.'s way to go around the institute about 11 o'clock. Yes, yes. To collect the following, to go to one of the pubs. Yes. And the discussions, the heady discussions at the yes. pub, uh, mm. and all guests, visitors, yes. would congregate there. Yes. And for a few hours, one yeah. one could get sparks or intimations exactly. of this, this incredible yes. vigor. Yes, that. they were those days, yeah. even that day. Yes, exactly. Uh, yes. I'm glad you find it so intellectually exciting, because the subject is so can be. It really can be. And I've seen it so often, year by year, with people who become intensely excited by such anthropology, in a way that those who practice more parochial disciplines seldom experience and hardly believe of us. I can't be denied that on the whole we don't have a very good scholarly rating in universities. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, the possibility of anthropology still occupying the position that was envisioned for it yes. at the beginning yes. as a new grace or yes. as, the, yeah. as, a, as, as a center for a liberal, mm. liberal education. That's possible. But it recedes, you seem to it imply. Was, it's I receding. think it's receded. I think it's become less and less uh, feasible, mm -hmm. certainly. Is that also because of the anthropology's dispersion of interests in, in so many, I mean, there's anthropology, there's no, a variety I, of I think the proper exploitation of, it, of its proper comprehension of interests. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's why is that? That's not a dispersal. Mm -hmm. Well, why is that? Why is, why is what? That we're doing the job more properly than we used to. It's not a dispersal of interests. No. But you're it's failing a, of... It's a more effective exploitation of the proper range of interests. All right. Mm. That is what's happened. Yeah. All right. Mm. But then we've lost the centrality to the whole exercise. In some people's view, we obviously have. There are some Manchester anthropologists, for example, um, who wouldn't agree with this. But um, I, I, I think that there is a centrality, which we find in the Alice Sociologique, which we find in Fustel de Coulange, which we find even in Comte. And that is a, a, a view of anthropology, let's say, as composing a kind of comparative epistemology. Hmm? Mm. Rather than a comparative sociology. Oh, yes, of course. Yes. 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 Which I find a far more trivial yeah. and, uh, and technical and, uh, in, in the long run, in the outcome, a uh, boring mm -hmm. uh, undertaking. Mm -hmm. All right. So that, so that uh, you... Comparative sociology is fine in certain ways. For example, all, all these long series of prescriptive alliance systems that, that we've been putting out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, these are as dull as ditch water to other people. Technically fascinating <laughs> to many of us. And if, if, if comparative sociology is anything, certainly that's what it is. Yeah. And I think it's tremendously revealing. But it's revealing not only technically, um, 
but by reference to the essential aims of comparative mm -hmm. sociology, which is what are the essential impulsions of form of social organization, mm -hmm. and in some ways, in more important, what are the constraints under which any form of social life um, mm -hmm. has, has, mm -hmm. has to operate. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, even this, compa this, this comparative sociology, this study of prescriptive alliance, yeah. leads to the questions of epistemology. Oh, yes, indeed. Yes and to fundamentals of sociology mm -hmm. and forms of the imagination. Mm -hmm. That's why prescriptive alliance is such a marvelous subject, a marvelous topic mm -hmm. to work on. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the simplest forms of social life that we know and that we can conceive. If we had to make up forms of social life, you couldn't think of anything more simple than the two-section system, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And Indeed. then conjoined this, with this, you have all the interest of the analysis of opposites, mm? dual mm -hmm. symbolic classification mm -hmm. of uh, these fundamental repertories of primary symbols or whatever you call them, mm -hmm. elementary symbols and so on, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and the ways in which they cluster. Mm -hmm. These are fundamental, I think, to an understanding of uh, the forms of consciousness. Mm -hmm. but, but, but you can't do them, of course, without doing, first of all, the technical work which is involved in studying prescriptive alliance per se. Mm -hmm. But as... And only we can do it. Yeah. Right. Sociologists yeah. can't do it. Yeah. Historians don't do it. But what are the futures? Uh, the future of even this oh, study in, anth in anthropology. I yeah. mean, there are fewer and fewer examples of these yes. these societies yeah. that we can study intact. Yeah. Um, and where does yes. one go then? That's a very worrying question because I think in the study of prescriptive lines, we reached the point that Tart was at. He wrote um, he wrote a book on opposition in the end of the 19th century, mm -hmm. in which he talks in the beginning about the the disappointing game. Mm -hmm of collecting opposites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's essentially disappointing because very soon you run out of the repertory of opposites to which people normally have recourse. Mm -hmm. And in studying prescriptive alliance systems, I think we've almost run the gamut mm -hmm. of the technically mm -hmm. and socially feasible mm -hmm. forms of prescriptive mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then what does the future hold? That's the question. Uh, the future makes itself up as it goes along. Mm -hmm.